of us in this state, 100 to age 30, is higher than I thought. So if you just hold that constant, it follows that 40% of this larger state of 4 million people, at least, have yet to be born in the next 30 years, if we take ourselves to mid-century, and translate that to 1.6 million people. Now, there's lots of things you can challenge in that calculation, but the main point is that any exercise looking out for the medium long term is bound to have 
That's something to do with people who are not monks. Young people, I'm not under 30, but at some stage I would have been. And it's kind of useful to get that sort of long term lens. Anyhow, moving on. Um, the report is uh, probably in your hands, you've probably seen it already. One of the distinctive features of all reports that the Public Policy Institute uh, produces is that we, uh, we make a real effort to combine uh, UWA expertise with that of practitioners. It's not uncommon to see in this report and others a real sprinkling of people who run real institutions, and in fact, several will be on the panel this evening. Um, a second aspect of anything that we do at the university, any report uh, or equivalent that we put out, is that we insist uh, that experts and practitioners lead readers and listeners and viewers with at least two proposals. The last thing we want is expensive analysis without any real sense of what might happen at nine o'clock in the Monday morning. In other words, this is uh, an exploration for an institute that exists in order to translate the fruits of our research, to do it in a timely way and succinct way, but above all else, to focus upon expertise and decision making. Decisions that are made at particular points, not the decisions that were made a fortnight ago, and the expertise is slightly misses that reader. Anyhow, there are many lenses you can take to our report, uh, and we'll hear your views and that of the panel later on. Uh, you can take a long-termist lens, you can take an intergenerational lens, you can take climate change, you can take drivers of change, treaty, uh, uh, change, you can take geostrategy and regional Indo-Pacific change. All of these things sort of go into the sort of melting pot, I suppose. But ultimately, this is about two core messages. One is the capacity to get ahead of these issues. What are these drivers of change in the future? Can we do that? And second of all, can we do policy differently? We should be, in other words, we can do policy differently by finding an effective way to harness expertise and to put it in the hands of decision makers in real time. A very small anecdote for what it's worth, in case sort of 30 year time frame, go back to 1992, the year in which I first visited Australia, for what it's worth. Of course, everything has changed and everything has not changed in the same period of time. If you walk past the plate glass windows, you may glance down at the UWA car park and notice a Tesla car being charged uh, electronically, putting something into what looks like essentially a fuel tank in the past. No doubt we convene in 20 or 30 years from now, there will be equivalent things that you can not imagine at that time. All these things are mixed, and ultimately our purpose this evening is to have a discussion around a few overarching threats that have gone into this report. We have people who will be talking about place, uh, in particular the fact that we are, depending on your point of view or your angle, located in the southeast corner of the Indian Ocean or the southwest corner of Australia or the very southern bit of Southeast Asia. It all depends on where you start from. We'll also be looking at issues of prosperity. I say that in the state that has got phenomenal aggregate levels of prosperity, to say nothing about distribution. And that may be sort of a bit of a roadmap for as to how the state would carry on in the process in the future. And we'll also be looking at the people of WA. Uh, even a quick glance uh, around uh, the state and the city will tell you the people of the state are changing and changing very rapidly. So it'll be worthwhile thinking about what the place and people look like in the future. I could go on, let me not. Let me pause now at this stage and introduce to you um, uh, Professor Peter Clinton. Uh, who, in a sense, doesn't need an introduction. You'll know him as the chief scientist of WA. He's going to talk a little bit about the report and the role of the report in a moment. Um, as the chief scientist, he has many uh, responsibilities. Uh, they range from uh, science and innovation, looking at broadening the economy through science, uh, looking at science industries, and lastly, acting as a science ambassador in the Indian Ocean region. But, but I really invite you to look at um, the testimony gave to the WA Parliament on Health and Education in August 21. Just Google it. Clinton Health and Education Committee, August 21. And you will see that his evidence that committee, which makes a very powerful point about the dangers of technology and education getting out of sync, in other words, lagging behind. The technological change is with us, it is ever with us, but it will carry on being with us in great measure. The importance is to make sure the education, the research, the insights, the takeaways keep pace. That's a plug for him and what he does. 
Can I now just uh, ask if you would like to come up and just share a few words? Thank you so much for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, can I start off by acknowledging the British learners in this land? So, Kai Murich for the Iman, Kai Murich for the Yoga, Kai Narikot. Hello to the big important men, hello to the big important women, hello everybody. Nija Waja, Nunga Buja, Nian Karich, Nunga Pretty Lama and Pretty Yoga, Kuru Kuru, Wayya Yay. This is the land of the Nunga people, particularly the Waja clan, the 14 clans in the Nunga nation. This is the land of the the, the Wajak clan, uh, I acknowledge their elders, past and present. And say, Nunakot, Nija, Mordich, Kedalak. Mordich, Kedalak. Everybody, this is a very special evening. It's a very special evening. And, and uh, I'm just so thrilled and honoured uh, to be invited here today to launch this very important document. Before I do that, can I just follow up a little bit on uh, your comment there around the evidence that I gave to the Education and Health Committee. Not many people have read it. Uh, <laughs> I don't recommend you actually go to Hansard and, uh, and do it. I, mind you, I, I would recommend that a couple of vice chancellors go and read it because uh, I've been misquoted quite extensively uh, on uh, what I said around the idea of amalgamating universities of this scope. I sit by the idea that some of those vice chancellors might want to go and have a look at what I actually see. So, for those that are interested in cancer, that's where it is. Um, I, I, I like this document because one, one thing it, that it does is it's got great alliteration. People, place, prosperity. What a great way to start off. I love it because it's got a vision that goes out to 2050. We're looking over the horizon. And I think we don't do that often enough. I think we become so busy with our daily lives, we're so transactional, that we don't spend our time looking into the future. And it is absolutely critical in a period of time that humankind has probably never changed more rapidly than we are now. We're going through the third and the fourth industrial revolution simultaneously. And if we don't manage to keep pace with that, and as we, as we talked about a second ago, um, if education can't keep up with technology, you end up with social pain. And there is a degree of social pain that's going on at the moment. And we as an incredibly prosperous and privileged state within a very privileged and prosperous nation, I think have a responsibility, we have a moral responsibility to make sure we don't leave anybody behind. We are doing so remarkably well. Let's make sure that umbilical cord between the haves and the haves not in a period of rapid change does not stretch anymore and we bring it together. It's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, one of the other things that I really liked about this document was it's the fact that the university is playing a key role in the engine room for thought leadership. And that is something that is incredibly important. And it's not just about academia, it's about in engaging government, it's about engaging industry, and it's about engaging the community. So I commend you and Lashana and the team that put this together because I think it's a visionary document. Clearly, it's visionary because is going back to 2050. Right? Um, I, uh, I've been hanging around with, with a group that I call the Cabal of Malcontents. Uh, a group of people over the last two years have been frustrated by the pace of change and have felt we wanted to accelerate uh, WA to change that notion that WA is place where you So, let me just share with you a couple of my thoughts and why it. It resonates with so much of what appears in this particular document. So this group um, we call WA plus WS breakfast plus what else could it be? And I think this document is in sync with some of the thinking that my Kabbalah and malcontents have been um, putting together. We we we, look, we were bold enough to go out to 2029 because it's the bicentennial of settlement here in West Australia. And this area here, by the way, 
the only part of WA that was actually ceded by the Wajak people to the settlers. UWA you know, is the only area that uh, we, and all our people tell me that, that happened. So what, what, would, what do we want our society to look like in 2029, going out to 2050, let's say? We thought we wanted it to be creative, cohesive, clever, courageous, compassionate, curious, and confident. Just a little bit of alliteration as well. You can see why I like the people, place, and prosperity uh, angle. So that's what we'd love to see about our society. Well, how do you get there? And we identified seven key areas in Western Australia where we have distinct comparative advantages and how do you turn those into competitive advantages? And just to summarize, the ones around our incredible mineral resources, our energy resources, the application of high technology that we do not celebrate, that we do not have a clear narrative around about the smart, sophisticated stuff that we do in the state. Our education sector is really strong, but could be even better. We have huge potential in the health and life sciences. We've got a fabulous indigenous culture that goes back 60 to 65,000 years in which we can build. And one of the seminal moments, I think, uh, Western Australia was the introduction of legislation that recognised the Noongar people of Western Australia for uh, I think that was a key moment because it's the closest thing we have in Australia to a truth that I can see. And finally, we've got this incredible lifestyle here in Western Australia. If you take all of those, and it's not that hard to imagine how you could turn those into something that was even better, that would underpin a curious, confident, cohesive, compassionate society. The challenge for all of us is to take these ideas and to implement them. It's what I call eye to eye. Ideas are cheap. How do you actually spend the time and actually invest a lot of energy in making sure that some of these ideas get translated into practical outcomes? So I love the document. The next challenge for all of us is to say, how can we implement them? So on that note, I will stop prattling on. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure for me to read the document. I think that the contributions are superb. I really enjoyed them. They were forward thinking, they were exploratory, they were taking us into areas that sometimes in the world, where did that come from? Right. But here's a moment we have in front of us. Western Australia, I think, is at a, at a, a real pivot point where we can grasp the opportunities in front of us and absolutely take off and future generations will look back on us and go, wow, that was really good. Right. You seize the moment, you seize the day, up the day and off we win. If we don't do that, I shudder to think what future generations will say, well, you had a great opportunity, but WTF, you know, so who's, who's that possible? That's, who's that possible for the next right? Um, how could you manage to mismanage that. So this is our moment. I really believe this is our moment to take off and to provide a wonderful beacon, not just for us locally, but nationally and then internationally. This document will be one of the seminal pieces of that transformation for Western Australia. So I congratulate the authors, the people that put it together, and it's my privilege and pleasure to formally launch WA 2050, People, Place, Prosperity. All the one, Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to invite the panel to come and sit up here. Um, you can come and join us, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. So can you hear me through the microphone? I think you can't actually, my impression. Yes, we'll hear you. 
You can. Excellent. Okay. So how do you take a report such as this with 40 plus uh, experts and practitioners and, and make it into a sort of digestible, coherent conversation? I know we involve the following four panelists. If you want to come and join us, um, no pressure then, panelists. So when I say coming up, can I just introduce, uh, just take, take your seats. Um, uh, in fact, sitting to my immediate left, to the right, as, as you look at her, is uh, Sasanki Mrs. Sang. Um, Mrs. Mann, sorry. She's the chief storyteller at the Center for Stories. Uh, she's widely published in the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald, the Guardian newspaper, uh, and the New York Times. She's a broadcaster and regularly appears with the drum and QA. Uh, she's also a holder of fellowships that have taken her to Aspen, Bellagio, and New Haven, which is Yale University. Uh, and she has a background of pedigrees, either South African, Zambian, Australian, or Zambian, South African, Australian, depending on how you count. Uh, but but uh, so, uh, Sophie, I gather, has been here for less than a decade, is that right? Yeah. So she is like me, a relative newcomer to these shores, I would say. And sitting to my right, uh, and your left as you look at us, uh, is Chris Rodwell. Chris's day job is CEO of the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry here in WA. Uh, my trade, I think you could be described as an economic diplomat. Um, he spent time with trade, investment, innovation, education. All of these things are both, I guess, fascinating to him, but also practically important. He was, uh, in a slightly earlier incarnation, Australia's uh, trade commissioner to Mexico and the Americas. Uh, and all of this uh, leads him to uh, a, a wide array of perspectives that allow him to focus upon the future of business and what may be standing in the way here in WA. Uh, sat to my far left, Rebecca, in, in, in the red. Uh, Rebecca is, uh, but there's a dot, 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 uh, as we speak, the CEO of the Royal Flying Doctor Service here in WA. Uh, she did tell me, but I'm not sure about, is it the fifth largest airline in Australia? It's the third. Third, right. Okay. But right. who's counting? <laughs> so she's running an airline as part of a sort of day job. Um, she's a board member of Infrastructure WA, but I actually know her best, we know her best, by, by virtue of the fact she's a state president of CEDA here in WA. And I think either out there or online, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Diane smith Gander, who's the national chair of uh, CEDA as well. So you're very welcome, Rebecca, and in fact, Diane. And then last but not least, uh, sat to my right, but in pink, not red this time, we have Sonia Arakal. Uh, Sonia's uh, day job is as a policy fellow for the Perth US Asia Centre, which you will recognize as the state's preeminent foreign policy think tank. Um, she's had many incarnations uh, prior to that. She was a staffer for both state and federal parliamentarians. She's spent some time in management consultancy and, and also as a lobbyist. And I gather, and this is not to be underestimated, I'm sure it will come up, in her spare time, she is uh, a, an accomplished producer in theatre and musicals. So as a plug there, that we're going to use that. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to use it. I'm sure it's going to come up. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the format is, is very straightforward. We're going to spend about 30 minutes kicking around some of these issues. From my point of view, just unpacking them with the panel, and then we'll go straight to Q&A here as well as online. Uh, my colleague, Rebecca, is the, um, the, the um, honest representative of people online, and she will sort of from time to time uh, repackage questions and put them to the panel. So feel free to sort of you know catch my eye. The road of mics, I think, will be going around. Okay, so that's enough about... What, what's in front of you. Uh, let's shed some light on this report. And I think the best way I can think of doing this would be to actually just go around the panel to start with and ask them to share in a paragraph, nothing more than that, just to get, get things going, a couple of questions, their thoughts on one, what does the idea of a thriving WA mean to you? Uh, to thrive, just thinking that through from the point of view of what you've said and others have said in this report. And I think linked to that, there's undoubtedly a sort of a sense of a big WA, something bigger, more successful, more in touch with itself and, and its neighbours. That big WA, what, what might be missing in that conversation if we're going to get from here to there? So I'm going to get that ball rolling. I'm going to turn to my colleague, Sasanke, to perhaps respond to those two open questions. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Thanks, Shamit. That is a good question to begin with. 
Um, <laughs> I, I think I want to start by saying that for me, inherent in the notion of thriving is, is the idea that we, we, we think very carefully about this question of inequality, this notion of social pain that, um, that the chief scientist just raised in his introductory remarks. Because um, my own personal background is as a South African. Um, my family was in exile for many years. And I come from a country that is the most unequal society in the world. Uh, and so uh, when I think about what it means to live in a place where there is prosperity, it's easy to think about that from an individual or family perspective, uh, which unfortunately is what is happening in South Africa. And it is much more difficult to think about a society-wide notion of what prosperity looks like. And so in Australia and certainly in WA, we have about 12% of people in this state who are, who are doing it very tough. 12% uh, of people who are uh, uh, close to structurally poor, about 100,000 people uh, are going to find it very hard to live outside of poverty for lots of barriers, many of which have nothing to do with themselves personally. Uh, and so these are fixable problems in this country. It's amazing to live in a society where the scale of the problem is fixable. And so for me, a thriving society is a society in which there is no inequality, particularly when it's doable. Thank you. And, and something on maybe some what's missing in the conversation about a bigger or big WA? So I don't think that there's a lot missing in the conversation. I think um, part of what happens in this state is um, that people, there are many, many very good ideas and many, many smart people, but there are also perhaps not enough people who are bridge builders and linkers between conversations. So what happens is there's a sense that nobody's talking about this and then I'll walk into a room and everybody's talking about it or why, you know, why don't these people say something and actually those people are talking very loud and nobody's listening. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, not what's missing in the conversation, but what's missing in linking those conversations together. I think many, many ideas are present, uh, excellent infrastructure, all the ingredients to make a place take off exist right here. I've just come back from Johannesburg, so South Africa is very much on my mind. And thinking about what, what this society was able to do around COVID and thinking about what my society, where my heart uh, still is at this moment, was unable to do with COVID uh, is, is not just disappointing, but in many ways, uh, heartbreaking. So, so there isn't anything missing in this place. Sun, water, beaches, ocean, <laughs> funny people, great schools, all the things, all the things you need. Uh, so there really shouldn't be any problems in this place. And so the fact that there are isn't about what's missing in terms of ideas or resources. It's about what's missing in terms of communicators, bridge builders, people who connect things together. Thank you. Chris, thriving. Right, and I might start there because I think there is some common common ground. I, I mean, my experience overseas is in Mexico, Chile, but um, living in those places, but working in many others, where you know there's a real issue, a fundamental issue around human dignity, and uh, and there's a real institutional weakness, which I agree we we have an institutional strength here, and we should use that for our advantage in the state, our advantage in this nation, but also not forgetting that we're part of a big bigger world. For for me, I, I don't see borders so much because of I suppose the experience um, that I've had. Um, so what matters to me is human dignity for sure. What matters to me is knowledge. Uh, and you know, we're in an institution that has been at the forefront of knowledge for a long time. But within that context, and you might expect this from me um, with a business lens on, but it's not just about solving business problems. It's an appetite for risk taking and an appetite for entrepreneurship. And I know that this state has had that during certain periods of it, of it periods of its time, but I am concerned we might be creating a society that is less open to that entrepreneurship, less open to the risk taking. And I'm not sure that the constituent parts of our society are supporting that 
And yes, you can start with the education system, which is lagging, not leading on an international basis, despite, I, I think, great efforts. But there's things that we can do. And I even reflect on the experience. I have four children. Um, and uh, the experience of them in a Mexico school where they're um, engaged around computer-aided design at younger ages, much younger ages, and much more systemically than they, than they are here. And then you take that all the way through to how do we create these, these new entrepreneurial businesses. And I think too often we are thinking that our greatest natural resource is in the ground and not here. We've got 2.7 million of these, and they're pretty, they're pretty extraordinary pieces of, of, um, of machinery. So how do we put the scaffolding around that? And one of the recommenda recommendations that I've put forward around that, which we can talk about later, is a regulatory sandbox is giving people a bit more freedom to play and develop new ideas that solve economic problems, solve societal problems. Thanks, we're going to come back to that again. Okay? Uh, Rebecca, share your, your thoughts. Thanks, Chairman. And picking up on uh, the earlier comments, uh, a, a thriving society pivots around the opportunity to participate is I think what we're all talking about. And to be able to be here tonight is uh, such a, an incredible space, uh, particularly after the experiences of the last few years. You know, we've taken for granted this ability to come together, to converse, to share ideas. Uh, CEDA is a great representation of that, the discussion, the opportunity to hear from different views, to be able to really formulate. We know we're at our best when we have a diversity of ideas at the table, when we actually have different voices with different experiences coming together to really solve the very complex of those problems that we're facing. And certainly for me, I lead an incredible team and it's been asked of me occasionally when I came into role to run a flying doctor service, you know, you're not a doctor and I have to say no, I'm yes, to be a nurse and I say no and they say, oh my gosh, can you fly a plane? And I still have to say no, can you fix the plane? Ah uh, no, <laughs> you know, what is it that you can do? And I think that it's a really important analogy that I have extraordinary people around me who are expert in all of those areas that bring that diversity of views. And as a team, we're at our very best when we're leveraging that strength and participation at the table. And I think that sense of thriving, if I can pick up on is today, and it's so important to continue to tell those stories that we've shared. You know, I represent an organisation that is quintessentially Australian. We don't send a band-aid to help someone, a mate, on the worst day of their life. We send a plane. In the most improbable of circumstances, in some of the most challenging places anywhere in the world, and we've been doing that for nearly 94 years. And to pick up on Chris's point around that courage, that risk appetite, you know, we are extraordinary and we need to remind ourselves of the things that we have embraced, the solutions that we have delivered and continue to inspire each other to do that. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. A lot of people would say it's quite a risk averse place. So let's, let's come back to that. Sonia, your reaction to thriving and, and a kind of big WA? I think I have a slightly selfish answer Go to what makes what thriving in WA looks like to me, and that shop's open past 5.30. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it's a joke, but I think maybe the more interesting point behind that is um, how do we make sure WA is a place where all the brilliant minds don't leave, whether it's Tame and Parla or Heath Ledger or um, our brilliant scientists and business people um, that have big seek opportunities elsewhere um, that aren't leaving for whatever reason, whether it's because shops close at 5.30 or because the um, industry or um, opportunity for their personal growth and our community's growth uh, means that they leave. Uh, I think that's a really important part of what um, thrive, a thriving WA looks like to me. Uh, it's about how do we prevent the WA brain drain. Uh, I also um, would like to kind of pick up on uh, Sisonke's point about, you know, wow, how well we have done as a state. Um, out of COVID and even how well we have done out of, out, um, as a state out of the resources sector. And, and so for me, when I think about what a thriving WA looks like, it's about how do we turn these natural advantages, whether that's our resources 
sector uh, isolation, the way we handled, handled COVID, to unnatural advantages. So how do we go from the resources sector to hydrogen? How do we um, capitalize on our isolation or our physical location, not because we can you know, put barriers up and prevent COVID from getting here, but actually send those bridges and make those connections out across the Indian Ocean, up into the ASEAN region, and indeed across the state. Um, and in terms of the limitations, for me, or what, what's missing in the conversation um, really resonated with me, Chris, your comments around this lack of an appetite for experimentation despite having all these natural advantages. And that's what's stopping us from getting to the unnatural advantages that uh, we've all talked about and we saw up on that slide. Um, I think the, the other uh, limitation uh, is in our mentality is the realization that the forces that shaped us in the past, or the countries where we had our major trading relationships in the past, may not be the playbook or the blueprint for our future. And that, that's a very um, difficult thing for uh, Western Australian policymakers to, sh to shape from because we are, uh, I guess, informed by the lessons from the past, but we shouldn't be limited uh, by those frameworks and outlooks. And I think it's very important for Western Australian policymakers to really realise that global trends have changed. There are new types of uncertainty, new types of threats, and that means we need new kinds of policymaking in WA. Okay, so while I've, while I've got you on that spot, as it were, let me just ask the first question I had in mind for you. Could you just maybe share with, with the audience your sort of, um, you know, sketch of the important trends and patterns that are taking place in this region? And you can define any region, version, version of the region you want. What should you be keeping your eye on, dear audience, in terms of the trends just out there for Perth? Um, Shamit, you talked about demography and Western Australia's own demography and how we have 40% of young people. Um, I think that's important, not just when we look internally, but also how we look to our Indo-Pacific uh, region. So we know that the Indian Ocean Rim region will be home to almost half of the world's population. But that's a huge um, force that should be shaping our thinking. Climate vulnerability. Um, uh, I read a report that um, said that the Indian Ocean is actually warming at a higher rate than other oceans around the world. Um, and this has implications for all those people we just talked about living uh, in the Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific region. Finally, energy security. So um, currently the Indian Ocean area, uh, which is where the focus of my paper in the report is, um, is home to about over 50% of the world's seaborne oil. So that means it's strategically really important. But as decarbonisation happens, the strategic importance of sea lanes in the Indian Ocean region might go down, but there'll be new winners and losers um, from that force. And finally, the great power rivalry. Um, you know, every day we hear about what's happening in, uh, in the geopolitical battle between the US and China and we are seeing that coming closer and closer to our shores. And it is a very real factor that should influence not just our domestic policy economic settings, but also our foreign policy settings. Okay, right. Um, and I'm just going to just very quickly on that, just a probe a bit, which is a lot of you must run into a lot of people who often say some of those trends feel real and some of them feel very distant. Um, superpower rivalry does appear very, very distant sitting here in Perth, certainly. Um, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that kind of sense of these things being tangible versus being intangible? Well, I, I live and breathe this in my day job, but I think when, when we think about tangible um, great power rivalry issues on our shores, uh, I'd encourage you to talk to um, our, our grain growers and our wine producers and people who are involved in the lobster industry, who for them over the past couple of years, it hasn't been intangible, this great power um, uh, kind of rivalry. It has actually been very real, what a dollar impacts um, on their personal businesses and livelihoods, but also on the states. Okay. Just carrying that forward, Chris, can I just ask you a couple of questions around, just for the audience's benefit? I mean, what, what are, but when it goes through your mind, what's the implication of having a state that is so heavily concentrated in a couple of industries? I mean, you'll know mm -hmm. the figures about how through the COVID years, 
the concentration around mining has actually gone up. Not that mining has got large, it's just the value has gone, gone up. Right, it, it, it constitutes 48% of our, of our GSP. And to put that in context, I think the next biggest is maybe Tasmania's tourism industry constitutes about 4% of its GSP. Uh, financial services would be about the same in New South Wales. So in terms of our exposure to one sector, it, it's um, quite significant and clearly one sector in one market. So um, I think it's just stating the obvious that a diversification of markets and a diversification of sectors um, is going to be important to manage some of the risk. It's not to say that we shouldn't continue to be strong uh, in the resources sector. And clearly um, there's a breadth of opportunities that sit across there in critical minerals for sure, um, which plays not only an economic piece, but there's a, a strategic a bigger strategic piece in in there uh, in hydrogen uh, um, clearly um, and, but but we've got to look at, at other places um, and maybe a bit of this is just know, know yourself stuff um, one thing we haven't mentioned is one of the world's great mega science projects is about to be built or is being constructed in this state it's called the square kilometer array it is incredible and we very much should hope and and i'm not saying western australia is the only home to this uh, there's another installation that will that will go in south africa and what is there 20 countries now signed up signed up to it this is an extraordinary opportunity for us in in space and it's not just a science opportunity although we hope there's many um many prize winners maybe out of, out of this university as a as a result of that it's what comes off that the innovation and commercialization which we've seen time and time again on mega science um projects throughout um human human history uh, but there's also the diplomatic opportunities that sit off that, the cultural opportunities that sit off that, um, the broader, um, even the construction opportunities, that, those broader societal impacts, that, that, could, that could bring in an, a, and really change the game just in and of itself for, for Western Australia. So they're the types of things that I think as, as a state, we should look to really embrace and recognise and excite excite the next generation about this you know we could be home to how many brilliant astrophysicists how how wonderful would that be um but i don't think we tell those stories enough and we don't recognize the the future value of them so okay Rebecca, do you want to come in on that point? Well, I mean, I think I'll end with our great Australian story, isn't it? 94 years of invention, uh, you know, in terms of concept of putting a plane in the air and sending it to the outback um, is just that sense of imagination. And uh, I couldn't agree more that we need to continue to tell those stories of our innovators uh, and, you know, to really champion opportunities and to recognise uh, the importance of us getting behind those ideas and, and inspiring and talking to, I mean, how many people appreciated that the square kilometre array is happening right here in Perth and how many of our young people understand what that industry is going to do for them, what those jobs of the future are going to look like and how many of our universities are actually leading with that as an opportunity for what those graduates need to be. Let's talk to those year three students about being those astrophysicists. Let's talk to them about being the next generation of John Flynn's. Uh, let's take space, uh, healthcare to space. You know, people say to me, what's next for a North Line doctor? And I say, space. And then this, oh, but actually it's no more crazy than the original concept 94 years ago of a doctor in a plane. Uh, space is the next level of remote care that we're going to need to be able to provide. And why shouldn't it be us? Why wouldn't we be able to leverage the technologies that we have in mining, the remote, industries that are being developed across Western Australia that are leading the world to be able to apply those in all sorts of settings, education, healthcare, uh, in um, support of commerce. So, so I think part of the, the why shouldn't why why shouldn't we is a good question and why might we not speaks to the, the two points that I think Sonia and Chris raised earlier, which is this question about our appetite for risk. Um, but it, when, when Shamit asked the question about the intangibles, you know, about like how you make, you know, big foreign policy questions tangible to people, I smiled to myself because last night my son and I went to the IGA. He was coming back from tutoring because I'm not happy with the public school system in which he is attending. But that's a different story, but relates to what you were talking about. So we're coming back from tutoring and um, 
And we decided to stop at the IGA and we get, you know, three little packets of like the ready-made food because we're running late. So get in the car, we go home. And at the till it was like 65 bucks. And it's really expensive. Hmm. I didn't say anything, but I thought it to myself. Like, wow, they're like tiny. So we get home and we're unpacking. And my son looks at me and he goes, wow, you know, Russia's really making an impact on us. He's 11. <laughs> he goes, Russia's really making an impact on us. I says, what, what are you talking about, big boy? He says, 65 bucks at the till. <laughs> and I was like, that's very impressive. <laughs> you know, that, that ability. So I do think that there is uh, a, a, a very clear way in which uh, what happens in the rest of the world we cannot shelter ourselves from it here in WA. And I think, you know, COVID was an, was an excellent example, but it was also an excellent example of, you know, your greatest weakness is often also your greatest strength, right? It's the flip side thing that happened in COVID. And it was so fascinating, kind of from an anthropological perspective to watch people in WA respond to COVID uh, at the same time as many people that I love and care about were responding to COVID somewhere else. And there was this like incredible anxiety, uh, which is born of privilege because your life really matters, right? People here really care about living a long life because it's possible. It is possible to avoid risk, right? That's a function of privilege. I think it's important never to take it for granted. I don't say that as a, a derogatory, I say that as a really powerful thing. So life is very, very precious here in a way that it unfortunately is not in many other parts of the world. So, so there's a risk aversion, which is born of a real desire to live long and be safe, right? And then there's also, there was this incredible policy, pragmatism and innovation that accompanied it, right? So you saw decision-making in real time about how to, how to keep people safe. So out of the desire to avoid risk, you got some really interesting innovation. And I think that's like the, a really good example of what Sonia's talking about when she talks about this idea of using natural advantage, turning an unnatural advantage, a natural advantage into an unnatural advantage, like how you really leverage. And so it just feels like it's been an incredible thing to watch how you, how, how this place uses something that can be a real criticism in ordinary times. I'm the first person to complain about how risk averse people are in this place and what it means to live in it, which means that things close at a certain time. But it, it, it was, it's been spectacular and really remarkable to watch people rise to the occasion. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start talking about some of the specifics of what you had to say in this report. This has been fascinating. We could, we could go on this to some of the things that have been proposed. Um, so, Sorge, just this one bit that came out, and, and you, it's both in the title you have at the center of the story as the chief storyteller, but you propose uh, that here in WA we should have an innovation, um, a sort of a storyteller in chief, which is sort of the words that move around with different hyphens. But can you just sort of explain to the to a lay audience, uninitiated, what the thinking was behind that? What is that as, as a proposal in this report? How come it belongs there? Sure. So my title at the Center for Stories is Head of Storytelling, not Chief Storyteller, but I might steal that because I think it's a great idea. Um, uh, <laughs> but really, a chief, uh, I think uh, to think about the state as having a storyteller in chief is much like, you know, the chief scientist. It's this idea that you do need people who are able to play this role of weaving and stitching and thinking about everybody. So whose job is it? Who's not a political figure? to think about and care for and be interested in everybody and then to think about how they relate to one another. So in a place where there's so much prosperity, one of the things that you can then begin to do is take social cohesion much more seriously and then to turn it not just from a piece of jargon, you know, an academic concept, but really to think about times of affect. If we are connected to one another, not familiarly, but because we recognize that we can rise together, because we recognize that there is a shared and joint vision about where we're going, because we recognize that you know, with uh, global warming and climate change, affective relationships are gonna be more important than ever. Because when you are in survival mode, the way we haven't been for very long, right, for a very long time, 
when you are in survival mode, as Cape Town was a few years ago, and we were approaching day zero with no water, then you have two choices. People fight or people come together and figure out how to cooperate. And there were some fantastic stories about cooperation that happened in Cape Town. People going to streams and having you know, a proper system of how to share that resource. Uh, but there were also very terrible stories about conflict, right? So in, in the coming, if we are going to be ready for a coming uh, time of leanness and difficulty, which I think we have to recognize we may have to, then those people who connect us, that person who's thinking about our story, our shared story, uh, a historian, someone who's trained, or maybe someone who's not, um, but who is respected and recognized, a kind of elder, or an elder-like type of figure who can be young, that kind of person, I think, plays a very crucial role at a state level, advising government, playing a role in being part of policy conversations, but also able to walk in community with respect um, uh, and with leadership. And, and just on this, so we understand it more, I mean, you could figure it as being sort of analogous to a, a chief scientist or chief whatever. What kind of things might they be doing sort of in year one priority, so we get a sort of sense of yeah. I think that it's someone who is analogous to the chief scientist or someone who is attached to the state library, right? The state library plays a hugely important role. Uh, this is a place of archive, it's a place where so much information uh, resides, but also doesn't necessarily get out enough. Uh, so it might be somebody who becomes an ambassador for that institution and for those institutions around the state. So I, I, I think that they would be attached to a living institution that ex exists and that they would play a role of advising and guiding senior leaders, but also walking in community. So year one would very much look like setting up a distinct institutional relationship um, with, I think, State Library it feels like the, the place where it best resides. Okay, we'll come back to it. Uh, Rebecca, so you've been running the Royal Flying Doctor Service for several years now. Um, I mean, the obvious question one would ask you, which is, what has that experience taught you about how you bring about greater connectivity in this vast state in general, regardless of people's need for doctors? I, I think if I could share a couple of pieces talking to that uh, sense of storyteller as well. And, you know, I've been sharing that, our own story, that of a flying doctor and that propensity for uh, community to look after each other, right? That what the mission is all about is being able to provide help in the most challenging of circumstances. And today, and most of us have a very uh, clever um, a technical device with us, an iPhone, an iPad, you know, we can sit and text to each other as we're talking. Uh, often I'll see my kids text to each other rather than talk. <laughs> and we've got this global connectivity as well, where we can have a WhatsApp group with our friends overseas or FaceTime and, and in real time. It's quite extraordinary. Yet I think we're missing this sense of actually what it means to be human and to be connected to each other. And that's what that story is so important about. What I often find, particularly for our service, is it's that connection back to the community. Oh, this is what it's all about. This is why we do this. We're here to help each other. And here's a tangible way in which we are able to facilitate that. So we can't have a tertiary hospital in every single part of our great state. There's 2.5 million square kilometres of Western Australia, which we're incredibly proud of that. And there's only about 2.5 million of us. Uh, it's about a person per square kilometre, isn't that kind of cool? Which talks to the very great strength of that distance. But at the same time, it needs us to be smarter around the way in which we use those resources and how we leverage those resources. And concepts like a blind doctor really show that propensity to be able to bring a hospital to the person and then the person back to that hospital. So what we're going to be able to see is the acceleration of technology, what it's done in the past 10 years is extraordinary. What it's going to do in the next two is even more incredible. I'm asked, what is the biggest challenge for your organisation? And I say our ability to adapt to the rate of change, to actually be able to put on the ground the capability of the technologies that are in place for us today, to embrace them and to accelerate them, and to be able to really leverage the strength that that brings. And I think that's the next stage for us as a community as well, is to really look at how we build those foundations, to be able to embrace what technology will deliver. We saw that in COVID. Uh, people with disabilities have been telling us for centuries, you can work from home, people. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Turns out that's a real thing. 
<laughs> and we shouldn't be going back on that. We should show, use these learnings to really accelerate those. So Chris, there's one specific that came out of yours that you mentioned already. Mm. Um, it's jargon, it's called a regulatory sandpit. Tell us what that is about and, and what's the thinking behind it. Right, right. And um, you know, you would expect in my role that a lot of it is consumed with looking at tax and regulatory issues to try and um, remove Im impediments. And I sit on Streamline WA that tries to streamline some of the approvals processes. And, and the one feature of regulation, uh, especially if you're a smaller business, is it is sapping capital, it's sapping resources, it's sapping time, it's sapping patience. So regulatory sandbox is kind of what it says on the on on the because uh, so the, the sandbox is the place you play, and if you think of your old kindergarten sandbox with the wood around it, it's got parameters around where you where you can play and how you can play, and the parameters are set by the by a government regulator um, that allows you to do proof of concept trials so that you can try and stand up something that's new, recognising that it may not fit within existing regulatory or legislative um, requirements. And it's not that new a concept, probably been around for a decade. In fact, the first time I really came face to face with it was when I was in Mexico, um, because ASIC was over there talking to the finance regulators around how they regulate the fintech. And it's been used all around the world in multiple countries for developing fintech and, and clearly in this one originally brought into, into play in 2016 with some additional work done by ASIC and some new rules set in 2020. Because just because you finish in the sandpit doesn't necessarily mean you go out into broader society. You might need to go to a different sandpit, a bigger sandpit, um, based on what those learnings are. But there are some protections that still sit there for society. It's just um, that it's a different it's a different playing field. And if you think around some of the regulatory, I would say, missteps we've had here, for instance, Airbnb and allowing local governments to regulate around it, well, that just becomes a mine, uh, a minefield for all, for all of us. So that's what we don't want to see. What we do want to see is is um, these sandboxes that could be used to help. And for instance, in a WA context, think of the hydrogen um, industry. Now, if you look at that and the existing energy and gas regulation, it's not a perfect fit for the hydrogen hydrogen industry. So if we take a sandbox approach, and I won't pretend to be um, the, any font of all, or, or wisdom on how, the, how those industries are regulated, there is definitely an opportunity that might sit there for us. If we think around health services in the UK, really around care quality, they're using digital triage, they're using AI in terms of supporting um, health services. So it can be used in many different, different ways. Um, there is sparse use of it in Australia, and I think a real opportunity for us in this state to forge ahead with looking at where, where are the potential applications so we can go about diversifying our economy and creating a more sustainable one at the same time. Cheers. And, and last but not least, so, so Sonia, um, you were saying when, when you were talking last week, you were making the point that A, there's obviously a federal election around the corner, and B, um, federal parliament might be a bit WA light. We'll say more about that. But also this kind of curious relationship between you know WA and, and the Commonwealth government when it comes down to sort of foreign affairs and, and trade. I mean it's not curious, I mean obviously things run by cabinet, we get that. But you kind of spied an opportunity there of some potential. Can you say something about that in, in your contribution? Sure. Um I talk a lot about how when it, coming up to 2050 in the mid-century, WA needs to take a more proactive role in defining its uh, value to the nation's foreign policy and in fact influencing it in order to ensure our state and our communities benefit from that foreign policy. Um, up until recently that's been actually a lot easier for us um, than you might first think. So we have been home over the last 10 years to either a foreign minister and or a defence minister. And we have benefited from that. So I work at the Perth US Asia Centre. That was opened uh, by Hillary Clinton, who came here uh, because Stephen Smith was foreign minister at the time. Uh, Richard Court, former premier of WA, became um, Australia's ambassador to Japan. When we have senior ministerial uh, 
Western Australian leadership, we have Western Australia's interests uh, at the table in big geostrategic uh, defence and foreign policy conversations. Whatever happens at the next election, we will no longer have a defence or foreign minister that is Western Australia based. And so that has implications for how our political leaders, both at a federal and state level, uh, need to be advocates for our interests. Um, we can't guarantee that the next Quad leaders meeting will be hosted in Perth. Uh, the next foreign policy think tank uh, is not, again, might, is not going to come to broom unless someone's advocating for it. So uh, we need to be thinking uh, much more proactively than we have in the past because that ministerial uh, representation from Western Australia uh, is not there as it was previously. Um, and you know, we've talked about the kind of trend uh, in policy making in general in Australia uh, towards decentralisation or what was always seen as purely uh, the Commonwealth's responsibility slowly leaking into the states. I don't think state for leaders have ever been more recognisable than during the COVID era. Um, and that too has implications for uh, the persuasiveness of state perspectives on Australian foreign policy. Um, and I, of course, uh, in my recommendations talk about Perth and how it's our Indian Ocean capital. Um, and we need to add a meat to that statement by really positioning ourselves as a regional engagement hub for those different threats that we talked about, whether it's energy security or climate change. We need to be the uh, jumping off point for engagement with the literal African countries, South Asia um, and ASEAN. And so we are really geographically uniquely placed um, and, but, we don't have those same advocates for, our, for us in Canberra. And so we need to be taking proactive steps uh, to, to put forward a uniquely Western Australian um, viewpoint. Okay, we're gonna come back to that in a second. So as I said, we're gonna spend 30 minutes on this and 30 minutes on Q&A, so I think we're at time. Never mind high technology, someone should buy a $2 battery for the university's clock. <laughs> 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 I'm happy to have a whip around if you um, but if that is 6.25, which is what it should be at this moment. Um, okay, so we've got some questions, uh, roving mics. Uh, the woman right behind you, Rebecca, is going to go first. Okay, and the other mic is where in the room, by the way? It's at the back. And then the lady right in front of you is going to be the second question. And then we'll pick, take into, into mingling that. We'll have some uh, online questions. Off you go, and if it's to someone in, in particular, say so. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, great panel. Um, my name is Kate Brooks, and I'm actually an astrophysicist. <laughs> 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 um, I have three children, three teenagers, and they are not interested at all in anything I do. <laughs> and they, uh, their world is digital. They live in two worlds, and they are excited about gaming, digital technologies. They consume digital, they live in it, they play in it, they socialise in it. Um, so place, you know, we talk about place. Um, how are you planning to have a place that is digital um, in 30 years' time? My kids, I could almost imagine when we could all do this at laughing going back in the day we used to send planes to fix people. Um, what is that digital vision and how do we prepare our kids to not just consume it, but actually be contributing and participating in that digital place? Perhaps Rebecca and Chris may respond to that. Okay? Oh, freaks, nothing complicated in that one. Like, <laughs> right? um, well, I think the really great way to answer that, you know, is that our incredible uh, children are going to create that space themselves. I think that's part of what's so exciting about the, the digital um, technology that's emerging. You know, I, I laugh when I, you know, someone says, can you fix the settings on the iPad? And, you know, my kid looked at me like, that's ridiculous. You know, you obviously don't know how to even turn it on properly. You know? And such is the sort of gap in that way and the tactility, um, you know, it's so intuitive. For a separate generation and, and I, I almost want to say I don't think we should try to define that world. I think it's actually about uh, talking to the pieces that we have, inspiring the creative and, and letting the sandbox have some safety boundaries but to explore themselves, to 
actually create. I, I tell a story, and um, I know, I know a lot, lots of these stories, but um, when our youngest was, our oldest was born, um, we were sitting playing tracks, and um, I, he was about three, and uh, he was just putting the tracks all around the house, and I'm like, dude, the track needs to go in a line, like circle, that's how the train goes. And he looked at me and he said, why does it need to go in a circle? And I'm thinking, it's probably got a point. You know, why does it need to go in a circle? Because that's how we've done it before around it having to go around. But for him, it was just going to go all the way around the house. And I use that as an example to say, I don't think we should define it. I would also really encourage that it's so important to balance the world, though, because we do still live in a physical place. And we do still need to understand what it means to have this conversation together and what it means to sit around a dinner table and talk to those ideas. And virtually is great, but so is the importance of physicality of what we're doing. And I think, you know, again, I, I share a story as a, as a young child, um, you're not allowed to do this for a myriad of appropriate reasons these days, um, but I'd go to work with my dad and I would see his world and what that looks like and how he operated in that. And I think that was such a grounding to see the possibilities of what is in that space. And I'm not sure that we're doing it enough for all those reasons around staying safe and appropriate. Don't get me wrong, I'm not about to advocate everyone's kind of work. Um, but I do think there's a balance around showing their world. And I spend a lot of time wherever I can bringing people to the flying doctor to show the breadth of the service. Um, because it's when you sit present and you see the scale and the way the pieces come together that you really understand just how extraordinary it is uh, the, the work that, that, that is undertaken. Hang on a second. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think part of it is that curiosity that was on that on that um, slide at the beginning. And so there's two things. One is to, to recognize that it, this is in some ways a, a thing around which we have to listen and follow. Uh, my son is intrigued by Bitcoin and NFTs. And, and it, my instinct, of course, is like, that is just scammer stuff. Oh my God, what are you talking about? But we had a conversation about it and he's so in, insistent on, on, on it, on, on so many things about it. And so we agreed that next week, Wednesday, we are going to meet with a financial advisor who's going to give us some advice and talk to us about what is Bitcoin? What is it? Look like? What is cryptocurrency? What is NFT? What if you put this much money uh, and think about how, what it means for him in a very practical way? Because he's like, I've got savings. I want to spend it on Bitcoin, right? And I'm like, well, you could never use the little amount of savings you've got. But to talk about it. So I think part of it is about um, having a conversation in which we learn from kids and in which they lead us into this, whatever the future is going to look like. So that's the one part of it. And I think the second part of it, and this is just as a parent, but the second part of it for me is like also recognizing this inequality question because there is a digital divide. And for many, many children, place will remain primary because that is the world in which, the only world in which they will be allowed to live and work, right? And so how do we make sure that that digital divide, that gap between but kids who have, who can dream and be anywhere in the world because they live virtually, and the kids who can't, but that, that, that shrinks. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, um, I have teenage sons as well. They actually are interested in physics, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, look, I, I do think it's a, it's, a, it's a systems issue here, and it starts with education, and we can say that this coming generation is digital native, uh, but um, I've seen their cohorts in other places in the world um, have much more, uh, developed much more refined skills in a digital age than, we, than we're putting into society here. And that is a fundamental curriculum issue that needs to be stared into and will not be resolved until it is. People are coding and using computer-aided design as often as they are studying their English literature or their literacy, literacy or maths. And that, that just has, has to change. The other thing though I would say is then it comes to understanding and identifying the pathways for that application. And in fact, 
WA is not too bad there because if you think about what runs our resources sector, the robotics, the automation, then there's some clear career pathways um, to really apply that skill. It's just there's probably a bit of a missing gap and it's not one that we're not aware of. I mean, Peter and I talk about STEM, STEM stuff from, from time to time and there is a strategy around it. We'd probably both argue it's not well funded enough. Um, <laughs> um, and there's obviously huge investments in SciTech, et cetera. And it's, I think you know, looking at just digital without thinking multidisciplinary approach is, is, the, wrong, is the wrong way to look. Um, but I would then go back to previous statements I've made about the regulatory con conditions, because that really matters. If you want a gaming, if you want a gaming industry, um, if you want some of those industries here, we need to look at the reg regulation. We also need to look at the promotion of them. Gaming industry is massive in Queensland, where I used to live, and it's absolutely tied up in the creative industries around film, etc. So our investments can't just just be there. They need to be thought of more more broadly. <laughs> No, just reiterating, I, I love this idea of reimagining re what place means in 2050. And when we think about a thriving WA in 2050, I hope it's being able to access government services on the metaverse. And that's not a joke. There are governments at a local and state level already um, developing those technologies, whether it's your local government or birth debts and registry. Um, there are so many opportunities uh, for WA, not to say uh, that uh, the digital world is separate to our physical place, but that as a state, we need to make our physical place in the digital world, uh, whether that's through access uh, to services through the metaverse, whether that's through growing our digital animation and gaming industries. Um, already, digital gaming is bigger than the film and music industries combined. And Australia is missing out uh, on that global uh, economic opportunity, whereas our closest neighbours, South Korea and Japan, are leading the way. So not only is it an economic opportunity, but it's another avenue for diplomatic or regional cooperation. We have so much to learn from uh, Seoul and from South Korea's investment in the national metaverse, because they're that much closer to delivering government services in the metaverse than we are. And so it's a great conversation to be having in the context of what W2050 looks like. The lady in the back, Christine Patience. Hi, I'm Rachel Antakula from the ASEAN Australia Strategic Gaming Partnership. Um, so my question is as to what Sonia was saying about the brain drain. And I guess I've seen lots of very bright and community engaged individuals, graduates from a high school from this university who have gone over east or internationally to pursue further studies and career opportunities. So I guess my question is what is being done and what can be done to address this? Is anything being done? I mean, who wants to respond to that? <laughs> I, I, I'm, first, of, first of all, I'd say I don't mind too much when people leave a place to go and gather experience elsewhere. It's actually a really healthy thing. I look for it in the CVs of people who come and work at our place that they've had that international experience. I deeply value it. it is, it's totally okay. Obviously, you want to be the net beneficiary over time of those skills coming to you. And you'll only do that by having the great projects and the great vision for how your state um, will develop. And I think we've got enough of them. We probably just need to spend a bit more time and, and effort in terms of attracting not only um, those skills, and that means... Yes, we need more international skilled migration, of which we've been particularly starved in the in the last few years. But the capital that come comes with it, um, it's, it's it, and that that promotion of opportunity, I don't think has been competitive. It may feel like that we're spending some money at that, but ultimately. This is a game where we're playing against other jurisdictions in the world, and we've got to play a bigger game. So let me push you back on that. Yeah. I mean, so um, given anecdotes have been used liberally this evening, um, you've spent enough time in, in the Western suburbs, which I do. Yeah. Uh, it's not uncommon at all. It's really quite common to have parents who will say, with a degree of boastfulness, the young Jimmy or Jenny or whatever their names are, is on a plane as fast as possible to somewhere else. Right. It's not uncommon, by the way. So whilst you're absolutely right, net, ben net beneficiaries over, over the life cycle, 
I mean, might we, as bold ideas, consider incentives? You know, the, the market is people can go where they want. We don't want to sort of run a sort of state that says, "Thou shall stay here," as it were. But you can you can tweak these things with incentives, can't you? Can you? I'd argue the greatest incentive is a great job, a great okay. career path. Um, and yes, it could be spent here, but we should also value people who engage in different cultural formats, different scientific formats. This is this is a critical piece of, of learning. Um, that and and the great the great news is is we've got a lifestyle and uh, that that's really hard to match anywhere in the world. And so you know our greatest hope should be they they come back to to create a family here and 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 others see the opportunities of that lifestyle match to extraordinary um you know globally significant opp opportunities to develop their career and then then you've got it I, I think that's the great incentive i'm not sure we know to put more okay. money into the into the game okay but you want to share some questions that come in online yeah we have a generalist one um for anyone who wants to come in in charting new directions for wa how important is leadership from the state government Okay, well, that's a small question. <laughs> um, but who wants a quick crack at that? Because it's we've been here all evening on that. <laughs> Look at Sonia, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, uh, very important is the short answer. Um, and I think for Western Australian political leaders post COVID 19, looking at 2050, it is a different policy mindset or style of leadership that's required. We need to move out of the command and control structures of COVID-19 response to um, the experimentation, the um, you know bold ideas, whether it's the metaverse or a chief storyteller or hydrogen. And that's a completely different mindset uh, and mentality that we're looking for from um, our state political leaders and our federal representatives. Anyone else wants to jump in? I'm, I'm, I'm happy, um, and I, I can't help myself, but I have to bring up tax at some some separate <laughs> because I think leadership on tax is is going to be really important, not just at a state level, but at, at a federal level. Um, the truth is, is that we have a taxation system that's old, and and it's not supporting what we want for our our society, and that includes a corporate tax rate that is completely uncompetitive at 30 percent that absolutely needs to be brought down into in, into in, into a better zone um here at a state level we're still pushing through with with stamp duty and we we haven't released the report yet but we've done a big piece of piece of work that looks at that from an equity point of perspective that is damaging people in lower percentiles uh, uh, and and therefore uh, you can assume, therefore, that it's actually um, dam damaging the prospects of women more so than it is that it, than it is men. So we want to talk about gender equity. Let's talk it from a structural tax issue. Again, we've done a piece of work on work on on disincentives for women working. Um, the way in which we handle childcare and tax treatment of, of childcare is again another place that we could see lead, leadership. Now that takes there's also a, a, there's a there's a national agreement in in place where funding for the kinder year is directed straight into the public educa education system, uh, absolutely destroying the choices of working families as to how they manage that particular year, which goes on to impact our workforce participation rate. There are, uh, uh, there are, there are a number, one, number of ways in which we can ask for leadership from the state government and, and the um, federal government when it comes to tax alone. That goes to another question online, um, and we can continue the first question in a second. Uh, given WA is one of the wealthiest places on the planet, do we need a super profits tax to fix inequality to increase? <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can I say no? <laughs> uh, anyone who wants to? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, I think, bear with me, I think the facts of the matter are that there are super normal problems being made without any more risk taking for some firms. Yeah. So you might want to say. So, so I should probably give a, a bigger answer it is that we clearly, we clearly need to look at tax reform, not from a single, a single tax issue, but as a whole of system <laughs> issue, which we did as 
a, a nation now over 10 years ago with the Henry Review, um, uh, and which, which, by the way, wouldn't be current today. You wouldn't need to reflect um, because there's moves that have been made internationally around a, a, a threshold for a, for a company tax rate, et cetera. Um, we need to look at the GST. That's absolutely clear. Um, we, we have one of the lowest consumption tax taxes across the OECD, which is um, meaning that, um, frankly, we've got, the, we've got the wrong balance. Now, I don't think we're going to see any um, anyone in the lead up to a federal election make comments about a GST, <laughs> but, but we are going to have to look at it and look at it in also respect of, of the debt and deficit issues that we face nationally. There's a question here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm very interested at the beginning when Cicely mentioned about about bridge builders and, and linkages, and, and about how storytelling is a connection. But with all of these topics, how do we bridge these gaps? How do we do the holistic thinking so that we bridge across the silos of the government departments? What are the mechanisms? Do we need to have an approach, especially around climate change, for instance? How can we pull it all together and work collectively towards that one aim? That's a hard question. Um, in, in some ways, um, what you have to rely on is that there are many people doing multiple things and that there are some organic convergences like that just that has to be you know part of the equation uh but it, it also comes back to the question that was just asked before this which is around leadership you do have an an unprecedented level of support for the leadership of the state right now like this is a kind of historically significant moment in terms of the kind of risks that a state leadership could take the kind of trust that people have in this leadership at this moment is significant, uh, and and I and I think that there is an opportunity there uh, to not take advantage of people's trust, but to to walk with people um, somewhere different, somewhere more visionary and imaginative, uh, especially given the. Extraordinary amount of resources that are here right now. So I think part of it is leadership that the linkers uh, has to be the, those who are entrusted politically to, to lead us and whom we have willingly given that trust to. And part of it is that you do have a very active community network of people. I mean, the fact that all these people have shown up today, I think, is at some level of indication. Uh, you know, Australians are incredible. Like one of the, the first things that hit me when we got here was Surf Life Saving Club, you know, like everybody is a volunteer on that, you know, there's so many people every single weekend just like <laughs> playing their part. So I think there is something about the ethos of community mindedness where that bridge building and linking is already happening. It's again that thing I was talking about, about how do you name it? So part of doing a story is naming the phenomenon that is already there, right? So it's there, it's about getting a group of people who are capable of saying it's there and these are the threats. And that's that's the work of everybody, right? It doesn't belong to one person. Okay, well, I'm just gonna quickly slip into the question at the back. If you be succinct, conscious of time. Uh, thanks, Dr. Okay. Um, I just want to make some comments and observations about the risk of capital and entrepreneurship. The last three plus years, I've worked with a diverse range of industry peak bodies and industries. And I'd say over that period of time, there's been an increasing intrusion into entrepreneur space and uh, you know, business with prescriptive regulation. Um, and I think there's, there's no question that regulations need to be there, but I think that the real intellectual challenge is for people for us to all work out how to achieve those regulatory outcomes without being prescriptive with regulation. Um, and the problem with the regulatory mindset at the moment is I've got a hammer, everything's an art. Um, but there are other models. Uh, I mean, the Govia is the current one, there's the Coastian and property rights type model. Um, unless we find the solution to this, the increasing prescriptive regulation is killing entrepreneurship and, it's, and, and, and you're getting a, a transfer. Well, in what I call industry welfareism. So the idea of 
public funds de-risking entrepreneurship to me is a complete oxymoron. And it's actually the thin edge of industry warfare where people won't consider being entrepreneurial unless they get a handout from the public first. So for me, this is a fundamental. Do you want to put a question as well? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, nice. Okay, nice. Uh, this is a yeah. Okay, then the last, last one. Okay, Prashant, I'm going to try and get you both, maybe just to make your questions very quickly, Prashant and Eve, then, and then we will wind up. Rebecca shaking her head, I'm just going to plow ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, maybe Eve first, she's on, on your way. Um, yeah, just uh, really getting back to the social issues, you mentioned we're going to 12% disadvantaged. Um, 2050, I hope we wouldn't be talking anymore about the disadvantaged First Nations people. Um, just wonder if there's any comment on that. How we're going to achieve that. Okay. How we're going to get just a reaction? Yeah. Uh, that, that is. That has been on my mind this entire conversation, actually. Uh, I, I think that the, the WA is in an interesting position as well because, um, because we have a far more significant population of First Nations people in this state than many other states. A, a presence, a strong leadership, uh, a chief storyteller in many ways should be an Indigenous person, uh, an elder, and we have so many of them. So, I, I could talk about that forever, but I won't. Can I, I just, uh, I can't uh, also really claim, I'm a country kid, so phonics isn't my thing, but Danja Kuruli, uh, which is an initiative uh, from um, First Nations people here in WA, looking at what we can do in a true spirit of reconciliation as we reach that 200 years of licensed, um, and how we can come together so that that is a genuine collaboration um, because it is obviously challenging um, in a celebration uh, for what it means for First Nations people and also what it means to be here for 200 years and I think that 10-year journey and the work that elders have done in leading, um, I think it's extraordinary that 10 years out uh, there's this embracing this is going to be a difficult year and how can we make the most of that opportunity together and we build that collaboration and that flexibility over a 10 year period? Um, so, the social impact is working a lot about that. And you can check it out online. It's extraordinary. Very lovely. Prashant, briefly. Yes, Prashant here. Yeah. Um, question goes back to uh, the digital divide and also the ability of digital to our, our economy. Last two years, what we have seen our jobs and people connection, everything is working on digital. And more and more agency than uh, you know, uh, businesses are like doing digital transformation projects. So we are struggling to get resources, especially you know, fundamental resources. So if you want to have a decent economy or prosper life, we need to have next uh, entrepreneurs or next technical lead or someone uh, you know, resources uh, trained here. 20,000 jobs are working for job cyber security, and we are really vulnerable as well. So we need to like this what the panel can start that. I'm not going to get the reactions on it. It's a well-made point. I mean, 20,000 short in cybersecurity is a killer uh, stat in itself. So thank you for that, okay? A conversation we had afterwards, I think, if you don't mind. I'm really short on time. I'm actually going to wind things up now, because um, at some stage I need to land this on the deck. Um, I'm just going to quickly thank our panelists. Of course, it's been, it's been fabulous to hear from them in, in this very expansive way over and about their individual contributions. I also want to before Rebecca, uh, thank Rebecca and Chris in, in the PPI, but also the interns this evening, Chris, to uh, Rihanna and um, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> uh, Gemma, thank you for my help. My... <laughs> it happens. Quick plug: uh, PPI will be um, with you again, not very long from now. Um, in a couple of weeks, just after the federal election, we'll be meeting downtown on the twenty fifth. Um, uh, it's the, at the State Theatre at 5.30, we've got a panel which involves uh, former premiers, common and common show as I call it, plus a couple, a couple of other panellists who will be sort of dissecting the entrails of the federal election. Good luck on that, Colin. Um, we'll be there at 5.30, State Theatre, 25th of May, you're very welcome, please, please come along. And then in early part of June, on the 8th of June at 7 o'clock in the morning, we'll be meeting in this building at a breakfast by the Bay event that will be dealing with the issue of diversifying WA's economy through sustainable new markets, as if it was a seamless conversation. <laughs> so those are two plugs for us. 
Um, can I now, um, before we wind up, uh, invite my colleague Linda Savage to address you. Uh, Linda is a member of the PPI Advisory Board. She's also past WA parliamentarian, some of you will know that, and an ambassador for children and young people working with the Office of the Commissioner for Children and Young People here at WA. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shannon. Um, let me begin by thanking everyone for coming today. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, and I'll <laughs> second time. Technology, huh? Shall I just speak loudly and uh, let me know if you can't hear me? So, as I said, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming today. And I'd like to make a special thank you to the panelists for the research that they've done and for expanding on the contributions that they have made, as well as to everyone else in the audience who also contributed to this uh, report, WA 2050. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of Professor Shannon Sager, Dr. Rebecca Ray, and Dr. Christopher Lynn for what they did to make this report come to fruition. The format, I think, very successfully makes the contributions accessible to many of us who I think would find it simply too daunting, too daunting to read an article on the subject in a specialist journal. And ending with the two proposals leaves the reader with an understanding too of the most pressing steps that need to be taken next. WA 2050 aims to stimulate long-term public policy debate, planning and reform, and help nurture better connections between the deep reservoir of expertise in this state and at UWA, and those who can use, about, can use it to bring about change. As a former member of parliament and as a lawyer, I know how important it is to be able to build a case on evidence that is robust and uncontestable. Yet knowing how and where to access that expertise, whilst obvious to academics and experts in the field, is not always so obvious to policymakers and those who work in government, non-government and the business sector. <clears throat> so building that bridge is at the heart of the work of the Public Policy Institute. In closing in the event, it was suggested that I say um, a few words about an idea from the report that resonated with me. There are many, so I thought instead I would finish by flagging two of the core assumptions that I think underpin this, the proposals. And that's the desire to build a better world for children and future generations, and the need for longer term thinking and strategy to do that. Some countries have started to develop policy and legislate to help ensure that the hard work of policy and long-term policy initiatives are not so easily sacrificed for short-term political expediency. They're known as legislative or commitment devices, and they can be found in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales, in the development of wellbeing budgets, for example, in New Zealand, as well as in the Parliamentary Committee for the Future in Finland. At their core is an attempt to build a future orientation into the machinery of government, something that many of the proposals in, these, in this report require if they are to become a reality. So let's hope when we look back on the proposals in this report in years to come that many have been able to make that leap. So thank you again to all our speakers, to Professor Peter Clinton uh, for the introduction, and I hope to see many of you either in person or online at the next function at the State Theatre Centre on the 25th of May, dissecting life after the federal election. Thank you. <laughs>